Jesus saw their faith. I was on the faculty of engineering at the University of Maryland all throughout the 60s. Some of you may be old enough to remember the 60s. And there were a lot of signs, you guys, you know, but I'll, I'll tell you the history. But it was the Vietnam War, a lot was going on in those days. And uh, there were signs on a lot of faculty doors even, keep the faith, keep the faith. What was the faith that we were to keep? Uh, I looked up some of the definitions of faith. This is from Steve, Steve Jobs. Something like light hits you in the head with a brick, don't lose faith. That sounds a bit like the 60s. And then there's faith is sitting in the middle of the storm of your life and still being able to close your eyes and picture the sunny skies, still being able to feel the better days coming despite the storm all around you. That's faith. Sounds a little bit more like wishful thinking to me. And then there's this third definition by Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's faith in something and enthusiasm for something that makes a life worth living. Faith in something. Is that really faith? What is faith? It's a bit like the news today as we talk about the word. Sadly, in our day, we still have real news and fake news. Fake news is something created by somebody to twist the truth to their own advantage or so they feel good. So how do the scriptures define real faith? Faith that matters. I looked at some of the scriptures that talk about faith. Uh, you may know Hebrews 11. That's called the faith chapter. And it begins, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Well, you know, that seems almost rather general too. That could be wishful thinking until you read a little further and then it says by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command so that we now see what we now see didn't come from anything that could be seen so faith is something that God has done it's faith in God according to Hebrews faith is grounded in belief in God <coughs> As Jesus makes clear in Mark 11, a little later on, he says, have faith in God. So faith is directed towards God, of course, and I know you understand that perfectly. Belief in faith is, is not just a, a belief in God either. It, it's focused in what's God, what God has revealed, and it's focused primarily in God in the flesh, Christ our Lord. His dependence on him. Paul makes that clear in Romans 10. He says, the word is near you and on your lips and in your heart. That is the word that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips, Jesus is Lord. That means something. It meant something then. Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar. Not our nation. Not anything else. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Something very specific trust in Christ, who he is, what he did, and his demand on your life, you'll be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, made right. One confesses with the mouth and so is saved. I remember a particular evangelism program that we used at the church I served. And uh, they used an analogy in there about a bridge, you know, this bridge across the chasm. And you could say to someone, look, look at that bridge. Do you think it would hold you up if you, if you wanted to cross over that chasm on that bridge? Oh, yeah, I believe that. I know the engineer who designed it. I know the company that built it. I know the materials. Yes. Now, if you want to know what real faith is, walk across it. Trust it. Go out on it. Jesus saw their faith. Their faith, which is interesting. It wasn't the faith of the paralyzed man, although we have to assume 
that he went along with it. He was very much in favor of it. He may have initiated it. But the other four who carried his litter, they were a part of it too. Their faith. You know, I, I don't think we appreciate as much as we should the corporate nature of our faith. We need each other. We need the faith of the body. You know, Jesus said, if, if truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are of you are gathered in my name, I am there among you. I think that principle of two or three helps us to separate out our selfishness. You have to agree when we pray. I can't just ask for something I want, which sounds great to me, but you may say, whoa, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like the Lord to me. Now, we can all mess up together. I realize that. But you see that the, the balance there, the check. We agree together. We're in this together. We need each other. We need the faith of each other. Jesus saw their faith. How do you see faith? Jesus saw their faith. Of course, Jesus saw the four litter bearers. The fact that they went up onto the roof with the paralyzed man. The houses in those days were built of a salt block. That's for the walls, the foundation. But then at the top, there were logs laid across. Wood, and then strips of wood laid the other way. And then baked mud, clay was put on top of that. And you had a stairway outside the house. In fact, you read in the scriptures about, uh, for instance, Peter was on the roof of a house. The different people can get up on the roof. Elijah prayed up on the roof of a house. And so you could, you could climb up there. There were outside steps because you had to repair the roof periodically like a thatched roof. And they got up there and they began to move aside the logs and to dig through the mud. That's the image here of what people saw. Like people were inside the house and you can imagine the dirt starting to come down and the openings up and there. So now everybody's looking up and seeing this thing happen. Jesus saw their faith. It was an active faith. It was something they did. Was genuine. Faith has to be something that gets us involved. It has to be real. It can't just be something we think. We just can't sit back and believe. I think James is right when he says, Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith is really not saving faith. Faith is trust in Christ. It must be the central truth of our life. It, it must do something make us different. Let's make us have different values, different purpose. It's the central theme of our life once we know Christ. Jesus saw their faith. And he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, he was brought there, I'm sure, for healing. But that wasn't the first thing Jesus dealt with. That wasn't the most important thing to him. In fact, we read at the beginning, and I, I pointed it out, he was there to speak the word to them. He wasn't there to heal their diseases and so on. Primarily, he was there to speak the word. He had said, if you are here last week, we talked a little bit about that. That's what Jesus said was more important to him, to get the word out, to spread the gospel, the good news. That was his primary desire, his primary focus. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, son... It is, is an affectionate term, no doubt about it. But it also carries the idea of, I have authority over you. Um, this came to my mind about the, the racism. You know, we used to call people boys and so on. We were men. Uh, I remember one time Fran told me about that. She was with a, an older uh, black gentleman, and she said, uh, sir, and he was startled. Now, we're talking back in the 50s now in the South. And he was startled by that, and he thanked her for respecting him. But here, Jesus is using the term son. Now, as far as we know, Jesus was a young man. He was, he was 30 or so. So I don't know if his, his paralytic was older or younger. It doesn't matter. The point is, it was affectionate, but it also showed his authority. Son, your sins are forgiven. Often healing is linked with sin in scripture. You, you, you know that. You need to recognize that. 
It isn't because a particular sin is the problem. It wasn't that this paralytic had done something very bad and that's why he was paralyzed. There may be no connection between his, his paralysis and his sin. The point is he was a sinner. And that was, he needed that. He needed the wholeness. He needed to be forgiven. In Psalm 44, verse 4, the psalmist says, As for me, I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. That's a personal involvement of sin with disease, as it were. In Jeremiah, the Lord says to the people in that day, Return, O oh faithless children. I will heal your faithlessness. Here we come to you, for you are the Lord and our God. There, there's a corporate thing here. There's a corporate sin of the people needs to be healed. There's healing and sin are kind of put together. That there's a, it's, it's not just forgiven as it were, but healed, made whole. St. Augustine said, our need not be paralyzed bodily, thinking about this incident. However, to be paralyzed inwardly, there's a, a spiritual paralysis. And so that's what Jesus deals with first. Son, your sins are forgiven. Your sin is forgiven. It's, it's not just general, it's personal to this man. Jesus is dealing with him personally, and he begins with his condition, his spiritual condition. He knows. He knows what the man needs. First of all, before he deals with anything else, your sins need to be forgiven. Throughout history, the church has shared the good news and built hospitals. We care about the whole person. But we usually begin with a spiritual condition. Son, your sins are forgiven. That's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone, they're thinking. And Jesus knows what they're thinking. And they're right. No one can forgive sin except God alone. Psalm 34, where the Lord first reveals himself to Moses, descending in a cloud, as it were, and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, passed before him, proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and yet by no means clearing the guilt. God is revealed as the one who forgives. The psalm we read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and don't forget his benefits. He forgives your sins and heals your diseases. David. I love David's response to his sin. I don't love his sin, but his response. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me against you. You alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You're justified in your sight. Blameless when you pass judgment. I was born you, a sinner from my mother's womb. You desire truth in the inward being. Teach me that truth. Make me whiter than snow. Wash me. The sin David says. And remember, David's sin that he's praying about here, that's made clear in Scripture, was adultery and murder. It doesn't get much worse than that. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. Against you, you only have I sinned. Now he knows he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah. But he recognizes that at the basis of it all is an affront to God. You were created in my image and you throw it in my face. And I have found that a difficult thing to think about many times. That my sins are not just against myself or against others or against my responsibilities or whatever it is. Sin against God. Then Jesus says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In order to prove that, I'm going to raise this man to help. The 
Son of Man. That's an interesting statement. Only Jesus makes it, and he makes it about himself. And some people have thought who, who are off base that it just means a man, you know, a son of a man, son of Adam. No, it does. It means much more than that. It comes ultimately from Daniel, from Daniel's prophecy. Daniel says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. That's the Son of Man. God the Son. <coughs> Every time Jesus uses it, not every time, but many times when he uses it, it's in connection with his second coming. You'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, he says, with great power and glory. People who have, have rejected me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory. In, this, uh, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Sounds like Daniel coming with the clouds of heaven. And the other times that Jesus used it, only Jesus uses it and uses it about himself, it's in the context of suffering. He began to teach him that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering. He'd be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again, seven more times he says that. Right up to the time when he's arrested in the garden. This is the Son of Man who has authority wherever he is, certainly on earth and in heaven, to forgive sins. It's God, the Son, God who is in the flesh. So he understands sin and suffering. It's the Son of Man who forgives sin. The Son of Man is coming again in power and great glory. Then he says to the man, Stand up, take your back, go to your home. That's the proof that he had the authority on earth to forgive sins. The healing completes the wholeness, as it were. I'm going to deal with the sin first, but then I'm going to deal with the physical health. They were all amazed and glorified God and said, We never say anything like this. It's true. They were all amazed. I, I hope you're always amazed that God loves you. That God knew you before you ever were. Before the creation of the earth. We're told. And I hope you glorify God. Remember that. One question and answer, which I still remember from Westminster Short Catechism, and I grew up as old as I am after people had to learn the catechism, so we didn't have to do that. But I, I knew the first one. What is the chief? It, it's in kind of old language. What is the chief end of man? Does anybody know the answer? Glorify God. Glorify, Glorify God and enjoy him. To enjoy him forever. Yeah, we remember that one. The chief end of all of us is to glorify the chief purpose. The reason we are is to glorify God and to enjoy it. We're going to sing uh, Hear the Good News of Salvation, which, which says such great kindness, such great mercy come to us from heaven above. Jesus Christ, how much I love you. Glorify God, enjoy Him forever. They were all amazed and glorified God. May that be true of us.